for the crowd that we read about in Mark chapter 11, as they laid their palms before Jesus' feet, as they laid their cloaks on the place that he would ride that colt, as they yelled for him, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of our ancestor David. These are fighting words. For that group, perhaps even for the disciples, the rest of that week would feel like complete and utter whiplash. The rest of that week would be incredibly hard to wrap your mind around. We ushered this man in. We thought he was coming to set us free from the powers of Rome. He entered like kings do, with shouts of joy with palms being laid, with our cloaks at his feet in signs of our reverence. Our text for today is going to cover chapters 14 and 15 of the Gospel of Mark. That's right, two whole chapters. I'm going to read two whole chapters, and you might be going, this is what I came to church for? But I want to read these two whole chapters because I think it is important that we hear this story. Uh, Many of us are familiar with the story of Jesus' last couple days. Many of us know them. If I asked you to tell me what happened, you could do that. You have read them before. You have read them yourself. I believe that this is a story that is not just for our eyes and our minds, though. This is a story for our whole bodies. It's part of the reason, you know, if, if you're new here, you're like, really, what is that? What are they doing, putting, like, plants on the ground? We don't do this every week. But when there's an opportunity for us to use our bodies to, to actually live out in some way the story of Scripture, I think it's fun to find those opportunities. It puts things in perspective. Did you know this is what palms looked like in the Middle East? We actually had to tear them apart because they were on massive leaves. We cut them into little pieces. This is a story for our whole bodies. And so we touched the palms. We moved our bodies. We laid them at the feet of Jesus in his table. We will later eat communion where we will touch food that is given to us by Jesus. And in those moments, we will taste the message of Jesus. We will taste and see that the Lord is good, as we are told. We have spoken this story in the psalm that we read together, in the songs that we have sung. We have seen it on pages, on screens. Perhaps at this point, you can smell it. Can you smell the palms? It's subtle, but it's there. Perhaps you can smell the expensive perfumes of the people around you. Those will come up in our story as well. Perhaps you will hear the story for the first time. Perhaps you've never heard this story read or spoken. I will remind you that we're pretty sure the Gospel of Mark was not written down until long after it was finished. We think it was preserved by saying it over and over and over and over again kind of like the people at the end of Fahrenheit 451 who have committed a book to memory that they could preserve it. And what that means is that we believe the Gospel of Mark, before it could be read, it was heard. To read the whole Gospel of Mark out loud would take you about 90 minutes. 30 of those minutes have to do with the last week of Jesus' life. One-third of this story is about Jesus' life. So as I read, I want you to pay attention to what moves your heart. Perhaps you'll hear the people who think they know how to fix things themselves only to have God say, no, you don't. You do not need a king who comes in. 
You need someone who will save you from sin and death and Satan. Perhaps you'll hear the bystanders pressed into service in one way or another for the story that God is telling. And you will be reminded that no one is an innocent bystander in the story of God. Perhaps you will notice all the people who desert Jesus. You will notice person after person after person who says, Sayonara, I'm out of here. I'm not doing this. Perhaps you'll notice that some of them can't flee quick enough. They do so without clothes. That's right. Perhaps you'll notice the women who appear to be the only people in this story who are able to bear witness to every moment of Jesus' life. They are the only ones who were there at the end of his death from his disciples, and they are the only ones who see where he is buried. Perhaps you will notice that despite person after person after person who abandons Jesus, Jesus still eats and drinks at the table with them. I want you to pay attention as I read this story. One of the hard things about a text this long is that there's no way for me to say, let's go point by point through everything that happens over a hundred verses. We would be here on Friday when it's time for Good Friday service. But I want you to pay attention to what it is that sticks out to you. It is my conviction that the things that has drawn your attention as I read this story, that is the spirit at work within you saying, this is something for you. With that said, this is the Gospel of Mark, chapters 14 and 15. It was two days before Passover and the festival of the unleavened bread. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the festival, or there may be a riot among the people. While he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar, a very costly ointment of nard. She broke open the jar and poured the ointment on his head. But some were there who said to one another, why was this ointment wasted in this way? This ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii, a day's wage, and the money given to the poor. They scolded her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me, for you always have the poor with you, and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to, to them. When they heard it, they were greatly pleased and promised to give him money. So he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, his disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the city. A man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house. The teacher asks, Where is my guest room? Er, <clears throat> sorry. Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So the disciples set out and went to the city, and they found everything as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, he came with the twelve. And when, he, when they had taken their places and were eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and say to one another, Surely not I. He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the bowl with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. And while they were eating, he took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. 
Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, you will all become deserters, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, even though all become deserters, I will not. Jesus said to him, truly I tell you, this day, this very night, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said vehemently, Even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all of them said the same. They went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John, and he began to be distressed and agitated. He said to them, I'm deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and keep awake. Going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. Once more, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to say to him. He came a third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. Behold. My betrayer is at hand. Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. And with him there was a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. So when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Then they laid hands on him and arrested him. But one of those who stood near drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Jesus said to them, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me, even though I, as though I were a bandit? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. All of them deserted him and fled. A certain young man was following him, wearing nothing but a linen cloth. They caught hold of him, but he left the linen cloth and ran off naked. They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests and elders and the scribes were assembled. Peter had followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he was sitting with the guards, warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none, for many gave false testimony against him, and their testimonies did not agree. Some stood up and gave false testimony against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Even on this point, their testimony did not agree. The high priest stood up before them and asked, Jesus, have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But Jesus was silent and did not answer. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, Why do we still need witnesses? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? All of them condemned him as deserving death. Some began to spit on him, to blindfold him, and to strike him, saying to him, Prophesy. The guards took him over and beat him. 
While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she stared at him and said, You were with Jesus, the man from Nazareth. He denied it, saying, I do not know or understand what you are talking about. And he went out into the forecourt, and the cock crowed. And the servant girl, on seeing him, began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again, he denied it. Then after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them. You are Galilean. But he began to curse, and he swore an oath. I do not know this man you are talking about. At that moment, the cock crowed for the second time, and Peter remembered that Jesus had said to him, Before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus and led him away and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, you say so. The chief priests accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further reply. So Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival, he, was, he, this is Pilate, used to re- release a prisoner for them, anyone for whom they asked. A man named Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during an insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. He answered, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? He realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed him over. The chief priest stirred up the people in the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again, What do you wish me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, Crucify him! Pilate asked, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole cohort, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him, and they began saluting him, Hail, King of the Jews! They struck his head with a reed, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak, and they put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. His name was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him, and they divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two bandits, one on his right hand and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, Aha! You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests along with the scribes were also mocking him among themselves, saying, He saved others. He can't save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from this cross now so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani! Which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, listen, he's calling for Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with with sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. 
There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. They used to follow him and provided for him when he was in Galilee. And there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. When evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate wondered if he were already dead. And summoning the centurion, he asked whether he had been dead for some time. When he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. Joseph bought a linen cloth and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. He rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where the body was laid. That is the word of the Lord. What stood out to you? We're not going to like, you know, take time you know don't shout at me but pay attention to what stood out to you mark it down write it down circle it in your bible write it on the back of your bulletin do something so that you can you can rest on that this week something for you to evaluate something for you to think about some question that you need to ask and and have answered what is it that stood out to you what is it that the spirit says this is the message for you this day What was it? If nothing else, if nothing else today, I hope that you heard Jesus' commitment to the plan. In Mark chapter 10, verse 45, he says, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. That means that before he came in and had had palms laid at his feet, before any of the, the, the things of this week had started, Jesus knew what the plan was, and he knew he was committed to it. I hope that as we read, the, as I read that text for you today, as you heard the words of Scripture I hope that you heard Jesus' commitment to the plan. The woman who prepared him for his burial. Communion, the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, whatever you want to call it, that he eats 12, maybe less hours before he's going to die with his disciples, one of whom is going to kill him or have him killed. And he says... The Son of Man must do what the Scriptures say He will do, but woe to you. I'm here doing what I knew I was doing, He says. I'm committed to this plan. He tells Judas that He knows what He's up to. He knows who the betrayer is. He doesn't stop him. When Judas leaves the house, He doesn't say, bind that man, tie him up. He doesn't say, let's off him. Even in the garden... With Peter, James, and John, we're told that he's in agony and despair. And he says, Lord, give me a way out of this if you could. But when God does not answer that prayer, he is still obedient to the plan. He says, get up, the hour has come. Here's my betrayer. He doesn't run away. When he finally gets to the temple, the high priest asks him a question. And Jesus provokes him. He says the truth, but that was a provocative statement. Are you the Son of God? Yep. What else could he have expected? Nothing. Because he was committed to the plan that he had been sent for. They take him to Pilate, and Pilate says, Hey, look, man, I don't really believe these people. They seem kind of jealous about you. Are you the king of the Jews? Well, you said so. Are you sure you don't have anything to say? I could have you killed. And he remains silent. On the cross, they nail his hands into a cross. They put a crown of thorns on him. He doesn't fight. He's lifted up and they make fun of him. Hey, can't you get down? Yeah, I could. 
Yeah, I could. Like, I've healed people from the dead. You don't think I can get off a cross? Yeah, I probably can. But he doesn't, does he? He stays on the cross. Even in the moment when the priests say, why don't you save yourself? Well, he's too busy saving you. Even when Jesus apparently feels abandoned by God, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, he yells. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Even in that moment, when he feels apparently abandoned by God, he stays on the cross. Sin had to be dealt with. Sin had to be defeated. And so he breathes his last. And in that moment, we are shown that God had not abandoned him. In the moment of Jesus' death, the temple curtain is torn in two. And that is representative of the fact that the way that God relates to all humanity is changed for the rest of time. No longer do we need a temple where we cannot get close to God. And even a Gentile, the very man who was tasked with killing him, looks up and says, truly, this man was God's son. In the moment of Jesus' death, we are shown that even though he, he might have felt like God abandoned him on the cross, because he, he stayed the course, God had not abandoned his purpose or his son or you and me. Jesus was steady to the end. If you heard nothing else from our story today, I hope that you heard that. That Jesus was steady to the end of the plan because he loves you. You are loved by God. God came to earth, took the form of a person, lived the life, and died for us. He died for you. He died for me. Why didn't he get off the cross and save himself? Because he was too busy saving us. When Jesus declared, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's perhaps quoting... The first line of Psalm 22. These were songs that these people would have known. These are psalms that they would have sung in church. And in the same way that if I stood up here and uttered the first line of a song, you might know how that song ends. Come thou fount of every blessing. You know that song. Perhaps even... Other songs, just a small town girl living in a lonely world, any way you want it. In the same way that I can say one line and you know the song, perhaps that's true of what Jesus is doing. And this is how that psalm ends. Psalm 22 ends by saying, all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations will worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. To him, indeed, shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall, all, or shall bow all who go down to dust. And I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. Thanks be to God that he has done it. Thanks be to God that he did not leave us sleeping in the dust of the earth. Let's pray. Thank you, God. God, I'm overwhelmed by the, the good news. 
I feel unworthy to preach it. I feel unworthy to speak it. Lord, as we prepare this week to walk with you to your death, we pray that you would keep in mind all the ways that you were faithful to us. And may your faithfulness to us inspire us to be faithful to you. Of course, Lord, we rejoice because we know that Sunday is coming. We know that the death of your son is not the end of the story. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us live as people who have been set free from the power of sin and death through the wonderful life, death, and resurrection of your beloved son, Jesus, the Messiah. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.